We're so happy to have you with us here. It's a blessing to have you in our roof here. And uh, I believe the Lord has a blessing in store for us again this evening. Uh, for those who were here last night, God did not leave us as orphans. He blessed us. Amen. And I believe he'll do it again this evening. So what I'd like to do is begin with a word of prayer, and then we'll start this evening's message. Again, we're addressing the topic of the problem of evil. Does God care? Let's pray. Oh, sweet Jesus, we need you tonight. We've always needed you, uh, but we definitely need you this evening in tackling a topic that is difficult. Uh, But I thank you that you're not intimidated by the world's problems or by our questions. So we pray that you would speak to us and give us your perspective now. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I will preface this evening's message by saying this is technically a part one, and part two will be our second to last meeting of this whole series. As you exit this evening, we're going to give you a schedule to let you know what nights the meetings are happening, what the titles of those meetings are, and when they will conclude, uh, when the last meeting will be. And the second to last meeting is entitled, Why God Won't Leave, and it's actually kind of a part two to this topic uh, this evening. But we're going to be addressing the issue of the existence of evil, And if God knows the future, as we talked about last night, and created everything good, good, very good, then why do people suffer today? And why is there a devil? And what role does God play in all of this? And what's he going to do about it? Well, the Bible gives us the origin of this problem. It's found in Revelation chapter 12. If you brought one of those Bibles I gave you at the counter out there, I've got page numbers for you tonight. It's page 1182. This is in the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 12, but it's page 1182. So if you grabbed one of those black Bibles on the table as you came in, um, then that's the page number for you, 1182. And this is what it says. It says, and war broke out where? In heaven. In heaven. I'm already confused. Anybody else? (laughs) <laughs> a place that's known as Edenic pleasure, war broke out in heaven. Michael and his, his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought, but the, the evil angels did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So there was a battle that took place in heaven, and we'll see what that was about here in just a moment. And there were casualties as a result of this, that people were displaced. There were angels that were in heaven who lost their place in heaven. But heaven is not a place where you would think that war would occur, is it? It just doesn't seem to make sense, but it did happen. That's what the text says. If you go a few verses previous to this, in verses 3 and 4, it says, And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon, previously we saw that was the devil himself, having seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems, that's crowns on his heads, his tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. Now, in verses 7 and 9, it talks about the angels being cast to the earth. And in prophecy, that's what's being said here. A third of the angels ended up losing their place in heaven in this battle. The devil himself, who we'll see here in a moment, used to be, you know, an angel, glorious in heaven, and a third of the angelic population that he convinced to join him in this rebellion are now displaced from heaven. And that's a massive divide, isn't it? A third of the angelic population? Who knows how many there are? There are lots. And so this word war that's used here in this text is the word polemos. And it's the root word for where we get the words polemics and politics. Both of those you can equate with arguing, right? The art of polemics is debating or arguing. And politics is is politics. (laughs) I'm not going to get political because it makes me sick at my stomach. So anyway, um, but it was primarily a war of words is what's being implied here. Now, that's not to say there wasn't a need for physical intervention. But what Scripture is portraying here is that there's a war of ideas. There's a war of worldviews that took place. And eventually, a third of the angels lost their place in heaven over this war. Now, Ezekiel chapter 28 gives us some more insight into this. This is on page 830 of your Bibles. Page 830, the book of Ezekiel, chapter 28, beginning of verse 11. It says, Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation, a song of weeping for the king of Tyre, and say to him, Thus says the Lord God, You are the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering, the sardius, topaz, and diamond, beryl, onyx, and jasper, sapphire, turquoise, and emerald with gold, a beautiful being. 
The workmanships of your timbrels and pipes were prepared for you on the day you were created. This was a created being. Now, it's telling a story that cannot directly apply to the king of Tyre, though it's directed to him, and it's because it's speaking about the force of darkness behind the man. There's a man behind the curtain, behind these dastardly deeds of the king of Tyre, and it's talking about Lucifer. It's talking about Satan. They continue. You were the anointed cherub who covers. Now, if you have any familiarity with the Old Testament services, or maybe you just saw like Indiana Jones and the Lost Ark, right there, there are these two angels over the top of the Ark of the Covenant, portraying what's been told in Scripture of what happened in heaven, right? There were two ministering angels standing on either side of the very presence of God. So when this person is referred to as the anointed cherub of covers, that means they were in the immediate presence of God in heaven. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of fiery stones. You were perfect in your ways, again, from the day you were created. But what happened? So iniquity, was found in you. iniquity was found in you. Sin. Now, there, there's, there's tension here. They were perfect, but then sin was found in them. And that tension's meant to be there. They continue in verse 16. By the abundance of your trading, you became filled with violence within, and you sinned. Therefore, I cast you as a profane thing out of the mountain of God, and I destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the fiery stones. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty, and you corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. So there was this form of, of arrogance and pride welling up in the heart of this being. I cast you to the ground, I laid you before kings that they might gaze at you. Verse 18, you defiled your sanctuaries by the multitude again of your iniquities. And again, it says, by the iniquity of your trading. That's the second time they've used sin and trading together. We'll come back to that. Therefore, I brought fire from your midst. It devoured you and I turned you to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all who saw you. All who knew you among the peoples are astonished at you, and you became a horror and shall be no more forever. Now, this word trading that's used here is the word rekula in Hebrew, which means to sell or to merchandise, and also could be an implication of gossip. So Satan was trading something. Lucifer at this stage in heaven was his actual proper name. He was trading. He was merchandising. He was trafficking ideas about God that were not true. He felt that what's going on here and how things are being ruled and led is not okay. It's not just. It's not right. right? He's starting to question in his own mind, well, how come I don't have that role? How come I'm not in that position? How come I'm not invited to those privy conversations? Why am I not involved in this? And because of this, he becomes arrogant and starts trafficking amongst the other angels, a third of the angels, convincing them that God maybe isn't who we thought he was. Again, our series together is A God Worth Knowing, re-examining the God we thought we knew. What if there are things that we may be believing about God that aren't true, that are unhealthy, and that are leading us to distrust Him? Okay, well, that whole game started in heaven, unfortunately. Okay, and this lie was that He's a withholder, that He's not looking out for your good, and that if Lucifer were in charge, things would look differently. Kind of reminds me of Absalom, King David's son in the Old Testament. You know, if I were in charge, we wouldn't have these problems here. I would make time to see you. But here's something else we see in this text. He's referred to as the covering cherub. This to a Hebrew mind would immediately make them think they were in the presence of God because of the Ark of the Covenant and the way that Solomon built the temple, King David's son, were the covering angels over the Ark of the Covenant. Okay, it's implying being in the very presence of God. It says also that they were on the holy mountain of God. Right? God many times revealed himself on mountaintops in the Old Testament. And then you were in the midst of the fiery stones. This is the very pavement that goes forward from the throne of God. So any Hebrew mind would read this, that you were in the presence of God, in the presence of God, in the presence of God. They're making a consistent point here in Ezekiel chapter 28. He was in the immediate presence of God. But then kind of the apex of that statement of, of, of contrast is in verse 15, that you were perfect, but iniquity was found in you. Now, this is a form of Hebrew poetry. They call it a chiastic structure. Now, this isn't a perfect example of a chiasm, but it is a similar example of a chiasm. I mean, it's not the exact format that they usually use. They usually have like an A statement is made, then a B statement is made, then a C statement is made, and then the main point is D. And then there's a similar statement that mimics C at the same point. 
and a similar statement as B that makes the same point. It's like a staircase. Similar points on both sides, but the main point of what's being discussed is what's at the apex. And we see a similar format here. You are in the presence of God, in the presence of God, you are in the presence of God. You are perfect, but iniquity was found in you. And so because of this, you had to be removed from the holy mount. You were destroyed as the covering cherub, and you were removed from the midst of the fiery stones. You were in the presence of God, in the presence of God, in the presence of God. But because you sinned, though you were perfect, you're now being removed from the presence of God, removed from the presence of God, removed from the presence of God. It's heartbreaking, isn't it, when you really think this through? Someone who had intimate fellowship with God Almighty through their own arrogance and pride and misunderstanding, created a monster within themselves, first of all, by cherishing those thoughts of distrust, and now have gotten other people involved in that same smear tactic campaign. And so, eventually, fire comes from his midst and destroys him, uh, as the way that the text leads out. That, and this idea is that this selfishness, right, this, this striving to be first, leads to destruction. That's what the warning is in this text. But there's another text in the Old Testament that also gives us insight into the fall of Lucifer. It's Isaiah chapter 14. This is page 667 in the Bible you were given at the table. Page 667, the book of Isaiah chapter 14, beginning in verse 12. It says, How you were fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning! How you were cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations! For you have said, and then where does it say it happens? In your heart. You have said in your heart that I will ascend into heaven, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. Now, we saw that the stars of God in Revelation were referring to angels. It's the same premise here. They're wanting to go above the angels. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. Verse 14, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. And then it has something that is absolutely heretical. I will be like the most high. Yet you shall be brought down to shale to the lowest depths of the pit. Satan had upward ambitions here. There are actually 12 upward words that are used in Isaiah chapter 14, in the verses we just looked at. He wanted to ascend. He wanted to go up, 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 up at the expense of everyone else. But the Bible says at the end of the day, he will be brought down. Though he's seeking ascendancy and seeking elevation, God will bring him down. But when it says that he wants to be like the Most High, it does not mean in character, it's position. He wants God's position. He's wanting to put his throne above the throne of God. But in contrast to that mentality, look at how Jesus and God the Father do life. Go to Philippians chapter 2. This is page 1130 in your Black Bible. Page 1130, it's Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8, says this. Let this mind be in you, which was also in who? In Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. The NIV reads this way, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. Jesus laid aside certain aspects of his Godness to become a man. He couldn't be everywhere all the time at that stage. Right? There were certain aspects that he laid aside to take on humanity. And it says that he did not consider robbery with God to be equal with God. But verse 7, but he made himself of no reputation. Now, is that going up or down? down. That's going down. Taking the form of a bondservant, is that up or down? down? Down. And coming the likeness of men. Now, if you're Jesus, is that up or down? Down. down. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself, that's going down, and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross, the most shameful and humiliating death available in Jesus' day. So look at Lucifer in Isaiah 14. He wants to go up, 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 up at the expense of everyone else, but at the end of the day, he will be brought down. But then we see Jesus, the perfect representation of God on earth, and he is more than willing to come down, 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 down for the uplifting of humanity. And here's what happens at the end of the day. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and given him the name that's above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on earth and those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. 
Jesus is willing to come down, down, down for the uplifting of all of us, for the uplifting of humanity. And at the end of the day, every knee will bow and say, Jesus Christ is Lord and worthy of worship. Jesus has much different ambitions in mind. He's not striving to be higher. He's willing to stoop to our level and he's willing to die to redeem us and lift us up in such a beautiful, beautiful contrast of the character of the two parties in this conflict between good and evil. One is self-sufficient and self-seeking. One is absolutely selfless and other-seeking. Do you see the difference this evening? Okay. This is how the kingdom of God operates, not by coercion or force, but by other-centered, self-sacrificing love. And love requires the ability to have free choice. What makes the vow so precious at the altar is that the woman has every right to say, I don't, but voluntarily chooses to say, I do. That's what makes love beautiful is the freedom to choose. But there's a risk involved here, isn't there? The young man putting himself out there and buying that fancy suit, there is a chance that she could say no in front of my parents <laughs> and all of my friends, right? In front of my pastor, it can happen. He's taking a risk here, but love can only exist in a context of risk. You understand that, right? Because you have to have free choice for love to truly mean something. The risk is that we can choose self first and the relationship can be destroyed. But for love to exist, the risk also has to exist. And God seemed to believe that loving us and creating us was a risk worth taking. He believes that you were worth taking that risk. And so he sends Jesus out of his love for us to win our hearts through his pursuing and self-sacrificing love to empower our choice to be used wisely, right? He gives us help. And we'll learn more about that help in two nights and two meetings later. So C.S. Lewis talks about this idea of the risk that he took, that God took. Listen to this. This is from his book, Mere Christianity. Anybody ever heard of C.S. Lewis? Okay, was a great Christian apologist defending the Christian faith during World War II in Great Britain. Was doing these radio addresses over BBC airwaves, communicating the reasons for faith in the midst of a very difficult and challenging time. Was a brilliant Christian mind in the early uh, 20th century, mid 20th century. So he says this, Some people think that they can imagine a creature which was free but had no possibility of going wrong. But I cannot, he says. Some of us think, well, why didn't God create beings that couldn't mess up, right? Right? Can't that happen? He says, I don't think that could happen to create someone who was free but couldn't actually choose wrong. The happiness which God designs for his creatures is the happiness of being freely and voluntarily united to him and to each other. Of course, God knew what would happen if they used their freedom the wrong way, and apparently he thought it worth the risk. Perhaps we feel inclined to disagree with him, but there is difficulty in disagreeing with God. He's the source from which all your reasoning power comes. You could not be right and he wrong any more than a stream can rise higher than its own source. When you are arguing against him, you're arguing against the very power that makes you able to argue at all. It is like cutting off the very branch that you're sitting on. If God thinks this state of war in the universe a price worth paying for free will, that is, for making a live world in which creatures can do real good or harm and something of real importance can happen, instead of a toy world which only moves when he pulls the strings, then we may take it that it's worth paying. You understanding where C.S. Lewis is going here? Right? To argue against God's reasoning behind this is kind of ironic because he's the very one who gave you the ability to reason in the first place. And if he truly is the all-knowing mind behind the universe, then it must have been a risk worth taking or he never would have taken it to begin with. And it was out of his love for you that he did so. I love that. Now let's go to Luke chapter 10. And uh, this is how Jesus and the Father felt about Lucifer's rebellion. You get kind of a, a sneak peek into the heart of God in that fall. It's in Luke chapter 10. This is page 1005 in the, in the black Bible that's on the tables out front. Page 1005. This is the book of Luke chapter 10, beginning of verse 17. So Jesus sent out the 70 missionaries to preach the gospel, to cast out demons, to heal the sick, and do all these great deeds. And they come back. And it says, they returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And you would assume Jesus is going to go, high five, fellas, way to beat the bad guys. But look at what Jesus does. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I'm sorry, what was that? 
Like, it doesn't seem to equate here. They're excited, and Jesus gives this strange response to their excitement in beating the bad guys and casting out demons. He says, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I give you authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. But nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Now, I see four things here in what Jesus has just done. The first is that he tells us that Lucifer came from heaven. We saw that in Ezekiel 28. We saw it in Isaiah 14. It's also alluded to here. And we also saw it in Revelation chapter 12. Jesus is acknowledging that reality. Lucifer did begin in heaven. The second thing I see here is that Jesus has promised victory. You shall tread on scorpions and nothing will by any means hurt you. Okay? You're assured victory in this battle. And I say amen to that. Amen? Amen. We're on the winning side. The third thing he says is that they're in need of humility. Don't brag, right, that you're beating the bad guys. Just be content with the fact that your names are written in heaven. But I think the fourth one is the one that gives us the most profound insight into the heart and love of God. Because Jesus is telling them, don't rejoice over the fact that they aren't going. It breaks my heart. And you know why? Because they all started in heaven together as one happy family. We lose sight of this. When we talk about the devil, we assume this is like Democrats and Republicans. We've always hated each other's guts since our existence, or the Red Sox and the Yankees, or whatever, you know, things you want to use, the the Confederates and the Unionists, whatever you want to say. Like, we assume that there has always been hatred and ill will on both sides of that equation, and Jesus is showing us that's not true. And maybe some of you know this. Maybe some of you have had a terrible falling out with your own family. It didn't always look that way. There was harmony, but some event happened and the family has never been the same since then. And there's grief there. Something's missing, right? And that that may hit pretty home for some of you people tonight. And I can relate to some of that to some degree. And Jesus is trying to help the disciples understand, look, I was there when he fell. I saw it with my own eyes. And it still breaks my heart to hear about it. And you boasting over your power over the demons doesn't really excite me because I created them. I used to commune with them. I know every one of them by name. Now, he's not endorsing what they're doing. He doesn't have sympathy for what they're doing. You understand the difference. But anybody here who has family members they love and care about who are doing horrible, wicked things, there's still a love in your heart for them that is different than what they're doing, right? That you can still find a way to to long for them to be restored and at the same time absolutely hate what they're involved in. Can anybody else relate to that? There's tension that Jesus is dealing with in the great controversy, in this conflict between good and evil. And he's bearing his cards here to the disciples to help them see that. Don't rejoice over the fact that they aren't going. I'm devastated by it. Just be glad that you are going. Let's not talk about that. I think it's a powerful insight to the heart of God in the midst of this massive conflict. So again, Jesus has not lived in an eternal state of animosity towards Lucifer. That's not been his eternal position. He's not happy with what he's doing. He hates what he's doing. But we cannot lose sight of the fact that this whole war broke out in a familial environment. It was a family affair. Yeah? God's heart is broken over this, beloved. How did it go from God creating everything good, 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 indeed, very good, to the state of affairs that we see today? Anyone else kind of wrestle with this? Why does the Bible say that everything God made is good, but everything I see around me is not good? Anyone else can relate to that? Yeah? Well, there's a snake involved. You ever use that in a negative context, what a snake that person was? Well, we're borrowing that from the narrative of Genesis chapter 3, the sneaky, subtle snake Satan impersonating a snake or, or, you know, embodying himself inside of a serpent and tempting Adam and Eve. This begins in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 1, okay? Genesis chapter 3 and verse 1. How is it that that war in heaven became our war here on earth? We're about to find out. Genesis chapter 3, this is page 2 in that black Bible that was on the table up front. And Genesis chapter 3, beginning of verse 1. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Now he's already implying distrust. Can you really trust what God said here? But the ironic thing is, he's using this, this exclusive language, this prohibition type language. Did he really say you can't eat of everything? 
But God said in Genesis 2, of all the trees you may freely eat. God actually used very inclusive language. He said, except for one, because in the day you eat of that tree, you will surely die. Now, God wasn't saying in the day you eat of it, I will kill you. He was warning them of the consequences of this decision before they made that bad decision. Why? Because he loves them. It doesn't want them to be lost and doesn't want them to be hurt. The same reason why you parents warn your children on dangerous things. One of my students was telling me the story today. Mom and dad told him, don't touch the light socket. What do you think he did in his moment of demanding to assert his authority? He was welded to a light socket. They had to beat him with a stick to get him away from it, right? But they gave that to him out of love and, and he did his thing, right? I'm gonna do me, get mine, and, and we see the consequences uh, even today and to some degree. <laughs> I kid. All right, so the point is God gave that warning out of love because he didn't want them to be lost, right? But Satan comes in and distorts God's perspective and God's words and says, did he really say you can't eat anything? You shall not eat of every tree of the garden. But the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it lest you die. Now she's actually stating words differently than God actually said them originally. She's adding details. She's getting confused. Then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die, for God knows. He already has knowledge of what you're not having access to and what he's depriving you of. God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw, so you're entitled to hidden knowledge, secret knowledge that God's trying to keep from you, but I can help you get there. So when she saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes and a fruit, a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she gave to her husband with her and he ate. And then the eyes of both of them were open and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. And then they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord. Anyone in this room have children? You ever had your children be scared of you and it tore you apart inside? This is what God is going through in this moment, that Adam and Eve are responding in ways that are wholly unreasonable because he hasn't come in as some tyrant who's always made them miserable. He has only loved them and communed with them in sweet fellowship. But their whole view of God has now been distorted. They're now afraid of God instead of a friend of God. So they, he said, where are you? And they said, we heard your voice in the garden, Adam says, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. A bunch of selfish pronouns used here. And he said, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree which I commanded you that you should not eat? Then the man said, the woman who you gave me, she gave me the tree and I ate. Ladies, you ever had the husband kick the blame to you and not take responsibility? You want to t all right, testify to that publicly? So, yeah, there's not just separation between God and man. There's now separation between man and wife. As soon as sin enters the world, it starts causing division amongst us and God and even each other. And the Lord said to the woman, what is this you have done? And she deflects blame as well. Well, the serpent deceived me and I ate. So the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, you were cursed more than all the cattle, and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. But Satan is trading here again, isn't he? It's very much like Ezekiel chapter 28. He's trafficking, he's trading, selling and merchandising ideas about who God is and how he does business that led to a third of the angels falling. And now the only two humans on earth have both defected to his side. Oh, it's heartbreaking, isn't it? Imagine how God feels. But then God preaches the gospel in verse 15. I will put enmity between you, the serpent, and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. There's a seed coming through Eve that will eventually overthrow you and destroy your influence. It's speaking of Jesus. And we'll talk about this tomorrow night. The coming Messiah who overcomes the devil. You maybe have heard in more pejorative language, he beat the devil with a big ugly stick, right? Now, uh, you can't see it behind the, the screen there, but the cross. So he's trading again here, but God gives the gospel solution. And this is the good news, beloved. As soon as man fell, he had a savior. Amen? Amen. As soon as man fell, God immediately preaches the gospel. A seed is coming that will fix this problem. And you can believe in him by faith today until he does that deed. In the same way that you and I believe by faith, looking back at that already accomplished deed by the grace of God. 
But some of us may ask the question, why does God wait to destroy the devil and his angels? Why didn't he just zap them at the very beginning? You ever wondered that? Why he doesn't just pull the plug right away and nip this thing in the bud? Well, Luke chapter 13 addresses this very question specifically. Matthew chapter 13, and this is found beginning of verse 24. It's page 948 in your Bibles. Uh, Matthew chapter 13, and beginning in verse 24. I have become lazy for my Bible usage because it's right here in front of me, but I want to at least open this thing and use it. I did pay for it, you know. All right, so Matthew chapter 13, beginning of verse 24 says, Another parable Jesus put forth to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field, but while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, then the tares also appeared. So the servant of the owner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? He said to them, Dang! You know, I have two bags in my garage, one's full of weeds and another's full of wheat, and I just grabbed the wrong bag. That's my bag. Is that, is that what he says? No. no, he says, an enemy has done this. An enemy has done this. And they said, well, do you want us then to go and gather them up? But he said, no, lest while you gather up the tares, you also uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest, and at the time of harvest I will say to the reapers, First gather the tares, bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. What's implied here is that it would actually be really bad if we acted early on in the growing season. It's far better and safer even to wait until the harvest. Then we can clearly distinct and, and with, with clear distinction separate this from this, and then we can destroy whatever's not supposed to be here. This is what he says. So he breaks down the parable beginning in verse 36. Okay, skip ahead to verse 36. Then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house, and his disciples came to him saying, Explain to us the parable of the tares of the field. He answered and said to them, He who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world, and the good seeds are the sons of the kingdom. But the tares are the sons of the wicked one. Now, previously in Matthew 13, Jesus had used another parable involving seeds, and the seed that was sown was the word of God. But in this parable, the seeds are people. The Son of Man sowed good people, but an enemy came and sowed evil people. Satan came and brought people to his side. Humanity defected to his side. But when Adam and Eve repented, eventually what ends up happening through the lineage of Adam and Eve is you have people who are following God, people that are not following God. The sons of God and the sons of men, as it says. Right? Two different lineages, two different trails of humanity. Those who serve and follow God and those who do not. Jesus is speaking in that very space, the very beginning of this fall circumstance. Right? There, and, and it's going to be confusing at the beginning. You don't know who's who. And you're not really going to be able to tell until the harvest. So he continues and says this, The field is the world, the good seeds are the sons of the kingdom, but the tares are the sons of the wicked one. Verse 39, The enemy who sowed them is the devil. And the harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. Then verse 40. Therefore, as the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so will be at the end of this age. The Son of Man will send out His angels, and they'll gather out of His kingdom all things that offend and those who practice lawlessness, and will cast them into a furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their Father. He who has ears to hear, let him hear." So Jesus is stating here that des destroying Lucifer at the onset of his fall would not have actually solved the problem. In fact, it could have made the problem worse. Because the, the remaining angels, the two-thirds of the angels who didn't fall, if God zapped the devil right then and there, the temptation could be, man, you better not make him mad. And they would follow God out of self-preservation or fear. But the Bible says in 1 John chapter 4 and verse 8 that God is love. Now, if God is love, do you really think God wants you to serve Him out of fear? That's not the context God wants. And God understood the ramifications, and He's playing the long game here. He may be misunderstood in the short term, but in the long term, He's going to be proven to be wise and have made the right decision. You understanding kind of where we're going here this evening? And why this has to be permitted to grow out. But it's not without his intervention. Remember, he preaches the gospel as soon as man falls. And every human being has the opportunity to choose salvation. 
but they also had the freedom to reject salvation. And the suffering we see wrought out on this planet is the fruit of people rejecting the goodness of God. Do you understand this evening? What we see in this earth of people taking advantage of somebody else or hurting or violating people is not because God is not striving with that soul to accept salvation. It's because they're refusing salvation and doing me. You see the difference? Selfishness is to blame for the, the chaos in our universe today. Selfishness, not God. There's a big difference. Okay? God had to let them see the fruit of Lucifer's way of thinking and what it would produce, and that fruit will be even more evident at the time of the harvest. That's speaking of the second coming, and I believe that time is very soon. We can't make assumptions and judge people based upon what we see right now. Did you hear me? We may think, oh, that's totally a tear, and Jesus is saying, I'm not done yet. They're going to turn from a tear to wheat, and some of us think, oh, that's elder so-and-so. He would never hurt anybody. And that person, though they look like a wheat right now, they may be a terror under their own roof, first of all, and you just never see it. Or two, they may leave the faith and become a terror. And the reason why Jesus doesn't give a final statement yet is because he's striving with every one of these souls to accept him, to love him, to receive forgiveness and salvation, and to be saved. It's the long suffering of God, Peter says. God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, but is long-suffering towards us, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. Are you understanding? So God is striving with these souls, even in the here and now. He's not passive. And we'll cover that in our second to last message together. Okay? So God is the best judge and determiner of where people's hearts are, not us. Okay? That's not our job. Now, the servants are asking the same question and projecting the same blame that you and I do when we encounter evil in this world and it overwhelms us. You made things good. Why are bad things happening? Did you notice that from the narrative? They say, sir, did you not sow good seed in the field? Well, if you did, then what is that doing in the field? And we can do that, can't we? In our frustration, in our, in our, our, our just anxiety, God, I thought you made things good. Why are bad things happening? And here's an illustration that's helped me with this. Let's say there's somebody in Europe who's a high-ranking governmental official, and they step down from their office. And as they step down from their office, they start going to all the media outlets, having press conferences, saying that the, the prime minister is involved in some really shady stuff. Now, you can't let accusations go on like this without having some form of investigation. So they have the investigation, and at the conclusion of the investigation, uh, actually, let's say that they, right before the day of the trial, let's say the trial's on July 4th, and on July 3rd, this now former high-ranking official is found dead in a dumpster somewhere the day before the trial. What do you think the general public is going to believe about the accusations that they had raised about the current prime minister? Yeah, there's something about this, right? So clearly somebody wants them gone. But let's say that doesn't happen. Let's say the trial does take place. All the evidence is laid out and they can't prove anything doesn't hold any water in court. It looks like total foolishness to the public. Do you think we would believe those findings? If we've had a proper trial, did a thorough investigation? Of course. This is what God has to do here. If God had zapped the devil, the immediate thought by the surrounding angels could be, man, maybe what Lucifer was saying was true. And we better not make him mad. We better watch our, you know, cross our T's and dot our I's because we don't want to make dad mad. Are you understanding? God knew this. We have to have a thorough investigation to make it clear that He has always been on our side, He's always stood for us, and that God is indeed doing what is best and has our best interests at heart. While Satan has only sought his own advancement and destroyed so much in the process. So that leads to kind of this logical question, why did God create the devil? And the short answer is, He didn't. God created Lucifer with the ability to choose. And Lucifer, as a result of the choices he made, became Satan. Do you understand the difference? That's not semantics, right? No one says, you know, about Hitler's mom, what a monster she was. How she could give birth to something like that, right? No, through the, through the surrounding environments, through the choices he made, the associations he had, the things he spent time with, he became what he was. He wasn't born like that. Do you understand me? Right? Evil is cultivated, it's ruminated on, and it's, it's planned. So that's not what happened in this situation. Love requires freedom, freedom involves risk, and risk entails a moral responsibility. Lucifer did not handle his moral responsibility well, unfortunately. And I've heard it said this way, that if sin could be explained, it's, it could be excused. That's why it's called the mystery of iniquity. 
How have you fallen, O Lucifer? And he's desperate for worship. We won't have time to go into this um, just because I want to make sure we end in, in a reasonable hour. But in Matthew chapter 4 and in Luke chapter 4, if you want to write this down, Matthew chapter 4 and Luke chapter 4, Lucifer takes Jesus into the wilderness and tempts him three times, if you're familiar with this story. And he has the audacity to bring Jesus up on a mountaintop and show him all the kingdoms of the world. And he says, all this I will give you if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus who is God. And John chapter 1 and Colossians 1 tells us he created all things. And Ezekiel 28 tells us that Lucifer was a created being. That means that Jesus created him. And the created is telling the creator, all this defiled world that I've destroyed and is a, is a mess, I'll give it to you if you worship me. He is so hungry for power and worship, even the worship of God himself. This is what selfishness does to us, guys. Selfishness unchecked is cancerous, it's malignant, and it leads to disastrous results. And this is what happened here with Lucifer. He showed his true colors in that temptation. He wants worship, even the worship of God himself. And this is why people need to know this topic today. So they know which side of the aisle to be voting for and who to be working with. Now, Luke chapter 13, uh, this is page 1009 in the Bible that we provided for you guys. Luke chapter 13, verse 10. Listen to what it says here. Another situation where Jesus makes a strong and clear line of distinction. He says, Now he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath, and behold, there was a woman who had a spirit of infirmity for 18 years, and she was bent over and could no way raise herself up. But when Jesus saw her, he called her to him and said to her, Woman, you are loosed from your infirmity. And he laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. And the congregation says, Hallelujah. But the ruler of the synagogue answered with indignation, because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath. And he said to the crowd, There are six days on which men ought to work. Therefore, come and be healed on them, and not on the Sabbath day. Then Jesus the Lord answered him and said, You hypocrites! Does not each one of you on the Sabbath lose his ox or donkey from the stall and lead it away to water it? So ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has bound, think of it, for 18 years, be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath? How much responsibility does Jesus take for the woman's infirmity in this narrative? None. Whom Satan has bound... An enemy has done this, Matthew 13 says. Jesus is drawing a clear line in the sand. The suffering that you are seeing, that was not my doing. But I'm not passively watching it either. Jesus relieved this woman's suffering. Jesus preached the gospel to Adam and Eve in the garden. He's striving with every single human soul right now. Even those who are the, the most vile of violators are hearing the Spirit of God and He's convicting them to change course because God doesn't want anyone to suffer or be hurt. And He's making this abundantly clear in His pursuit throughout humanity or throughout human history. I want people in the kingdom and I'm striving with them, convicting them of sin and so forth. As John chapter 16 says, he's convicting the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. So Satan is a source of all suffering. It comes from an enemy, but thankfully it's a defeated enemy and he's not going to get the last word. Amen? Amen. Now 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8 says this, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And that's page 1165 in your Bible. But he's not just the enemy of God. Right? He hasn't just made himself the enemy of God. He's made himself the enemy of man. All the problems that you have and, and how people treat you today is not a problem between you and that person. I hope you're recognizing this this evening. What we've seen this evening is that there's a man behind the curtain. You ever seen The Wizard of Oz? Right? There's a man behind the curtain who's orchestrating these acts of violation and abuse and so forth. And people are just the channels through which he's doing that. Right? Those days when your guard is down and you say that thing you wish you didn't say, that, oh my, I'm so sorry. I, 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 like, that's not the life that you normally live, but you have these moments and something just happens. I'm not saying you're like crazy demon possessed and need an exorcism. The point is that when we let our guard down, right, we can be used as chess pieces to achieve Satan's ends. Are you understanding the difference? Right? And, and this is why Peter says, be careful. There's an enemy out there. You've got to be on guard. 
You got to keep the right mind. You need to have the mind of Jesus throughout the course of your day and not just roll in your own armor because if you're just rolling in your own armor, good luck, right? Usually it doesn't go too well, at least it doesn't for me. So there's a man behind the curtain who's behind those people's actions. He is your enemy. He's responsible for the darkness coming into the world. Does that make sense? Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 9 says this. Paul says, For I think that God has displayed us, the apostles, last, as men condemned to death. For we have been made a spectacle to the world, both to angels and to men. What he's implying here, the word he uses here is the word theatron, which is basically many people in their day would have thought of something like the Roman Colosseum, right? Where people are sitting in this big circle and watching people duke it out in the sand down below or fight a lion or a bear or some other craziness, right? That Paul is implying here that people are watching what's going on in this earth. Not just humans, but even the angels themselves are wondering, what are these people going to do? Because God has said that I'm bringing them to heaven. And they're thinking, are you sure about that? We've gone through this once before. Are you really going to let this happen again? To have another rebellion happen, another tearing apart of the home. Angels are intently looking at what's going on here. One of Peter's epistles, he says, speaking of the gospel, these are things in the outworking of the gospel in your life and in mine. He says, these are things which angels desire to look into. They're watching us, guys. And not as these like snobby, like big brother, you know, creepy types, but they just want to know, does this plan of salvation really work? Can we really trust God's transformative power? And that's the same thing that you and I wrestle with if we're really honest with ourselves. Could God really change me? Could he really do what he says in my life? I know he says that he can make all things new. He can save sinners and so forth, but you don't know my story. It's pretty dark. It's pretty bad. Could he reach the depths of my wretchedness? Absolutely yes. Absolutely yes. So there are unfallen worlds and, and beings who are watching this, and they want to see how this comes to an end. And think about those two-thirds of the angels who did not buy into Lucifer's lies, and they're weighing out in their minds if they really want humans living with him for eternity and risking that rebellion. But here's the good news. Matthew chapter 25 and verse 41, Jesus telling a parable here. Then you will say to those in the left hand, depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire prepared for who? Devil. The devil and his angels. Is your name on that list? No. no. God has a plan to completely eradicate sin from the universe. That's what he's promised. And your name is not on that list. He doesn't want us to be there. Now, unfortunately, there will be people who do end up there, but it's not because of God's choice. It's because God honoring their choice to reject the gospel. You understand the difference? He's even striving with the lost. He doesn't want us to be there. He doesn't want us to experience that. But because we chose to believe a lie and pictures of God about our own condition and who he is, that's why this happens. But in Ezekiel chapter 28, again, we're told in uh, verse 18, you defiled your sanctuaries by the multitude of your iniquities, by the iniquity of your trading. And therefore I brought fire from your midst and it devoured you. And I turned you to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all who saw you and all who knew you among the peoples are astonished at you. You shall become a horror and shall be no more forever. The devil himself will be destroyed and the rebellion will be over for good. Even so come Lord Jesus. Amen. I want that day to be soon. But here's what he wants for you, beloved. Matthew 25 and verse 34. Then he's, the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, and inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. From the very founding of the earth, God desired for every single one of you to be in heaven, not one of you to be lost. God created you with a special purpose. You are beautiful, unique human beings. You're the only you available to God, and He wants you to be used for His glory. Did you know that? There are no other yous available to, the, to this nation, to this world, to the universe. It's just you. You are unique. You are special. You are valuable. And God preordained from the foundation of the world, He wants you in heaven. But what decision will you make? Whose side in this conflict are you going to take? That's the million dollar question, beloved. Whose side of the story will you believe? Do you believe that God is a withholder and can't be trusted? Or do you believe that he's altogether lovely and he's loved you from the very beginning? Amen. What do you believe? Nahum chapter 1 and verse 9 tells us, Why do you conspire against the Lord? Or what do you conspire against the Lord? He will make an end of it. Affliction will not rise a second time. Amen. We've seen how this goes. We're not going down that road again. 
So knowing what the universe knows, it will not happen again. There's no longer going to be questioning of God's intentions or plan. Seeing Satan who started all of this, crucified Jesus, made up the mind to the angelic beings. Now it comes to you and I. What decision are we going to make? But the good news is that when God puts an end to sin, He really puts an end to sin. And our understanding of what rebellion, doubt, and transgression will do, we're never going back. So Jesus truly became sin for us. We'll talk about this tomorrow night so that there's no need for us to sympathize with sin anymore so that we can be saved and forgiven. So in Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2, the very beginning two chapters of the Bible is the story of a perfect people in perfect communion with a perfect God in a perfect environment. And if you fast forward to the very end, the last two chapters of the Bible, Revelation 21 and 22, you have the same story, beloved. A perfect people and perfect communion with a perfect God in a perfect environment. And everything in the middle is the story of redemption. God's plan to win his people back to himself, to overthrow the devil and his influence, and to bring a people as his own. God created a beautiful world and people to enjoy it with. And we sinned. We bought into the lie and our world has been broken ever since. But because of the promise in Genesis 3 and it being fulfilled in the Gospels, we can have that fellowship with God once again in that world made new. Revelation 21 tells us that He'll wipe away every tear from our eyes. There shall be no more sorrow, nor death, nor crying, for the former things have passed away. And then He says, Behold, I make all things new. And write it down, John. These words are true and they are faithful. You can take it to the bank. Amen? So guys, God is not looking for reasons to exclude you or anyone from heaven. There are 12 gates into the new Jerusalem, we're told in the book of Revelation. That means ease of access. He wants you there, but do you want that? Are you willing to give Him your heart? Are you willing to give Him your all and go where He's leading? That's the question. Now, I want to close with one last thought here and then we'll be done. We've shared about how evil has come into our world and so forth, but I think it's very important that we need to address the harm that comes to us, not just in the world, but in religious environments. This is Paul telling his story. Uh, he used to be Saul of Tarsus, a religious persecutor. He killed people in the name of God, people who believed in Jesus. He had a face-to-face -face encounter with Jesus on the road to Damascus, and he tells this story. He says, while thus occupied, he's telling his testimony to a king, to King Agrippa. He says, while thus occupied, as I journeyed to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priest, at midday, O king, along the road, I saw a light from heaven brighter than the sun shining around me and those who journeyed with me. And when all had fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me and saying in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting my people? Is that what it says? It says, why are you persecuting me? Yeah, but Jesus is dead and ascended into heaven at this stage. So did Saul of Tarsus have a warrant for the arrest of Jesus? No, what Jesus is saying here is, you're persecuting people who follow me. And in persecuting people who follow me, you're actually persecuting me. I take that personally. And this is such good news for us today, guys, because if you've been hurt by religious people, People who overstep their bounds, they beat you over the head with the Bible or authoritative writings. They try to manipulate you, ruin your reputation in the church. Maybe they physically or sexually violated you. Whatever the story may be of religious people overstepping their bounds and making you miserable. And for some of you, it's a miracle you even walked into this building tonight because of what you've had to deal with by people who claimed to know God. Jesus wants you to know this evening, I have nothing to do with that. When they were persecuting you and hurting you in my name, I was hurt by that. Guys, we have a Savior who's intimately acquainted with our grief. He understands and He is distancing Himself from any form of abuse, any form of violation, any form of harm that happens in religious settings. I hope you're hearing me this evening. God has nothing to do with bad religion. He doesn't do that. And he says, well, who are you, Lord? And again, he says, I'm Jesus whom you are persecuting. But rise, stand on your feet, for I've appeared to you for this purpose, to make you a minister and a witness, both of the things which you have seen and the things which I will yet reveal to you. This violator, God even saw something in him. He knew if this guy surrenders to Jesus, I could change his life. I could turn him around. And the easy thing for us when we hear things like what I'm just covering right now is to get upset and say, yeah, 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 that's right. You guys are bad religion and, and I'm going to come get you. No, no, no. The early church was praying for Saul of Tarsus. 
And those prayers led to him having a face-to-face encounter with Jesus, and he was never the same. He was a champion for the gospel, and Jesus saw that. That means it's possible for people to be redeemed from bad religion. So don't seek revenge from these people. Pray for them. You don't have to have them back in your day-to-day life. I'm not asking for that. Be safe. But what you can do is pray that they would have an encounter with Jesus, that they would change, and he can do it. If he can reach Saul, he can reach anybody. He says, I'll deliver you from the Jewish people as well from the Gentiles to whom I now send you. I've got the calling for you, Saul, to open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. In the same way that he can turn Saul's experience from darkness to light, he can do that for you. He's done it for me. And he can even do it for those people who are harming folks right now quote-unquote, in the name of Jesus or in the name of God. So there is someone behind the evil in this world, but I want to make it clear to you this evening that God has nothing to do with the harm that's been done in the name of religion, that He identifies with those of us who have. Jesus Himself was crucified by abusive, hypocritical religious people. You know that, right? He was crucified by religious people, and He came to redeem them too. And I believe He's asking you and I to give Him another chance and to see that this was not his doing. Some of us maybe wrestle with God because we feel that he signed off on what happened to us. And I'm telling you this evening, on his behalf, he had nothing to do with that. He did not sign off on that, and he's asking you to come home. It's actually safe to come home. I had nothing to do with that. You can come home tonight. You can say yes to me. You can trust me with your heart. Again, if I know the future, I know what's happened to you, and I can turn things around. I'm what you've been looking for. I've never done you wrong, never would do you wrong. I've only looked out for you. I've only loved and cared for you, and I'll continue to do so the rest of your life. So Paul's story gives us hope. He turned him from darkness to light and used him to be a champion for his work. We need to pray that that'll happen. So here's my appeal to you this evening. Do not let Satan steal your Christian experience by your encounter with bad religion. Make your decision based upon what God says about himself in his word and with your experience with him. Don't base it on people. People will fail you, but God never will fail you. You understand the difference? So that's the appeal this evening. God created a beautiful world and people to enjoy it with, but we sinned. We bought into the lie and our world has been broken ever since. But again, because of the promise made in Genesis 3 and it being fulfilled in the Gospels, we can have that fellowship with God again in that world made new. Do you want to be there, my friends? That's you. I invite you to raise your hands to heaven. You want to be in that new world, that new heaven, that new earth? And do you want to let God heal those wounds that have been caused in religious settings and give them another chance? If that's you, I invite you to raise your hand this evening. Uh, It's unfortunate, and it breaks God's heart. I know it breaks your heart, and I'm sorry. On behalf of whoever has done these things to you, in the name of Jesus, I want to apologize. Jesus had nothing to do with that. He never signed off on it. But on behalf of religion, I'm sorry. It wasn't okay. It has never been okay. And by God's grace, we can let him write a new story in a faith experience. Amen? Let's pray. God, thank you for loving us so much, for being so faithful to us. And God, we're sorry. Maybe some of us have caused harm in a religious setting. Forgive us. We pray for those who hurt us in religious settings. Forgive them. Cover their sins with the blood of Jesus and give them a face-to-face encounter with Jesus Christ himself and change their lives, we pray. And God, I pray that you would help us as tomorrow evening we go into the real story. We've been alluding to the context of the big picture, but the real story is what Jesus has done for fallen humanity. God, I pray that none of us would miss that meeting. I pray that none of us uh, would miss an opportunity to invite somebody else to come tomorrow night and to hear the story of Jesus that will change their lives. And Lord, I pray that you would exceed our expectations in that. Thank you for every soul who's here and for everyone who's listening later. Pray your hand of blessing over them as well. Cover our sins with the blood of Jesus. Fill us with your spirit. And we ask these things now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Again, tomorrow night, the faith of Jesus, the story of the plan of salvation, you are not going to want to miss this one. We'll see you tomorrow.